Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast has evolved over the five plus years since it first launched. From now on, I'm going to be talking about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. And also mindset, of course, but mindset of all kinds, not just business mindset. I think. Things are changing for me, as you may have noticed if you've been following me online or listening to this podcast, so anything goes here. I hope you stay along for the ride. Thank you so much for joining us today, and now let's get into this week's episode. Hello and welcome to the Into the Woods podcast, episode 368. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I've got a very exciting guest today, Yvette Webster, who is one of my favorite bloggers, and she's also my blogging coach. She's based in Scotland, but she's originally from New Zealand, and she writes all kinds of fun and exciting things about hiking and camping and backpacking in Scotland. So Yvette Webster is a full-time travel blogger at Wayfaring Kiwi and Kiwi and Haggis. She's a lover of nature and the outdoors. She was the first solo female to hike the Scottish National Trail, an 864-kilometer trail that runs the length of Scotland, but beginning in the south, on the border with England, and ending at Cape Wrath. She's currently writing a book about her hike, and I cannot wait to read it. So, we talk in this episode about how to take your hiking to the next level. And this is something that I'm personally interested in because I'm looking at taking, kind of upping my game with my hiking and my backpacking and my long distance trails. And I want to know how to do it safely. And I think I'm not the only one with this question. I think a lot of people are always looking to challenge themselves a little bit more with their outdoors activities in a safe way. So we talk about her experience hiking the Scottish National Trail alone. We talk about how she prepared and what she would do differently this time if she had to do it all over again. We talk about how the actual experience of hiking the trail compared to what she expected. We talked about what she got out of hiking the trail, what she learned about herself. And as is often the case, and as you've heard on this podcast before, hiking a long distance trail is as much an inner experience as it is a physical experience. So I hope you find this episode interesting and useful. I think it's a really juicy conversation, and I'm super excited to share it with you. Hello, Yvette. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm really excited to talk about my favorite topic (laughs) of all time. And I'm so excited to talk to you about hiking. (laughs) So why don't we start out by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got into hiking? Yeah, sure. So I guess it wasn't really like a decision I made to get into hiking. I grew up on a farm and I was always surrounded by animals and nature. And I actually grew up in the mountains in New Zealand for the first five years of my life. And so I was very just kind of used to being in that environment. And obviously, like living in New Zealand, it's like my backyard was just like filled with amazing hiking trails and things. So I would always be outdoors and doing something outdoors, whether it would be horse riding or snowboarding or something like that. But I didn't really get into proper hiking until I moved to Canada in the Rocky Mountains in a place called Banff, Alberta. And yeah, so basically like the scenery in Canada is just incredible. And so me and my friends would often go out hiking together. And that's when I kind of learned I really loved to go out solo hiking. So that's where the passion for it all started. And then that kind of carried on when I moved to Scotland. (laughs) Mm. So what was your first long distance trail? Like what was the first time that you went from doing a day hike to a multiple day hike? It was actually the Scottish National Trail. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) So I went from like zero to 100 (laughs) with long distance hiking. I do remember back in high school, I went on a trip and I think it was like a three day hike and it was quite easy. I mean, back then I thought it was just the worst thing ever because I was a (laughs) hormonal teenager. That was all led by a group. And so it was a lot different Mm. to the hiking that I do today. Wow. So tell us about the Scottish National Trail, because this is something that's been on my list of things to do since 2015, and I haven't had the time to do it, or I haven't made the time to do it, but it's like I'm dying to do it. So most people probably haven't heard what is the Scottish Scottish National Trail. 
Yeah, and that is so true because when I was actually doing the hike and I was telling people about it, no one had actually heard of this hike. (laughs) But basically, it was devised, I think, in 2015 or maybe a little bit earlier Mm -hmm. by a man called Cameron McNeish. And he's like a big wig in the outdoors Scotland sort of circles or industry, I should say. And basically, he wanted to design a hike that ran the length of Scotland and incorporated a lot of the main trails that already exist in Scotland. And he actually went out and did the hike himself and wrote a book about it. And then he started a website about it as well. And that was the only real sort of marketing or media that was done around the hike. And then it kind of just, I don't know, a lot of people just forgot about it or it wasn't really talked about much. Mm. But basically, it starts the Scottish-English border in a place called Kirkyetham, mm-hmm. which is a place that a lot of Scots haven't actually heard of because it's a really <laughs> tiny, remote little town. And it finishes in Cape Wrath, which is the most northwestern point of Scotland. And it doesn't go like straight across. It actually like zigzags. So you're actually seeing a lot of the country as you go. So it's kind of like a it's like taking the long road, the more <laughs> scenic route. But I think it's about 864 kilometres long and just over 500 miles long. So it's a pretty decent walk. It is a pretty decent walk. So what made you decide to walk the Scottish National Trail? Were you already living in Scotland at that point or did you travel there to do it? How did that work? So I was actually living in Canada when I decided to do a long distance hike. And the original idea was that I was just going to go hiking for two weeks and just be in nature and use that as an opportunity to disconnect from technology, reconnect with myself and do some writing along the way. And I was actually intending on doing this in Germany. Oh, wow. (laughs) So there was something called the Romantic Road and you can walk, hike or drive it. And that kind of appealed to me because I thought it was something that was a bit different. And after that, my plan was to move to Scotland. But then the idea kind of popped into my head where I was like, are there any trails like this in Scotland? Like, is there a long distance trail that I would be interested in doing? Because for me, I've got Scottish ancestry Mm. and the thought of connecting with Scotland on that kind of level really appealed to me. So yeah, I just basically started Googling and the Scottish National Trail popped up. And as soon as I started reading about it, there was just this like feeling that was like, you have to do this. Like, this is your path and you were doing it. And this is before I had even researched what this hike incorporated like I had no idea I just decided then and there like this is what I'm doing and nothing's gonna stop me (laughs) well you've got to go with your gut feeling sometimes like even if it's totally illogical (laughs) exactly exactly it was just this like voice in my head was like that is your path like you need to do that hike so yeah (laughs) I love it so how did you prepare for it not well (laughs) So I'm one of those like horrible people that if you've got an exam the next day, I'll leave everything to the last minute and then I'll kind of cram it all in just before. That was a little bit like how I prepared for this hike. So I guess the planning that I did do was I obviously I bought my hiking boots a month prior to starting the hike and I wore them absolutely everywhere. So Mm. I wore them like in the middle of Edinburgh, like shopping. I wore them to the pub. I wore them absolutely everywhere because I really wanted to break them in. Mm. And I think... I also decided that I wasn't going to catch any public transport. If I needed to get somewhere, I needed to walk there because I just wanted to build up my walking fitness a bit more. And I think I did maybe one three-hour walk with my pack on, but it wasn't full. It was just like kind of like an empty pack with a water bottle inside it. And basically anything that was kind of concerning me, for example, like river crossings, I just Googled and watched YouTube videos on what to do. And luckily, this hike was a hike that started out quite easily and then gradually progressed. So Mm. as my fitness improved as I was doing it, and obviously, like I learned things as I got as I went, I was able to then like progress through the hike. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So if you were to do it differently today, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently to prepare? Okay, (laughs) that's a good question, because there were a few things like a few mistakes that I did make. And some of them put me in quite hairy situations. But I would say that I wish I had sent like care packages ahead for myself because yeah. once I got to the highlands, quite often I would be hiking for days without any type of civilization. And when I had to restock and buy food, often it was just a very small shop in the middle of nowhere where I was restocking. So I feel like if I had sent care packages ahead of the things that I needed, because 
as I progressed through the trial, like I needed different items for different parts of the trial. So I feel like that would have been a good idea. Um, I did this really silly thing where I was like, oh, right, once I get to Fort William, I can buy this map that I need to hike the Kate Rath Trail section. And of course, when I got to Fort William, they had sold out of this oh. specific map that I needed. <laughs> Yeah, and so I was like, oh, you know what, I'll just start it and then I will rely on my phone because I was using that to navigate and I will buy this map when I get to the next to a small town. And of course, that's the moment that my spare battery decided to pack it in. And so my phone actually was very close to dying when I was in the middle of the Highlands by myself. So that was quite scary. So I think just obviously having the right kit and so basic, but carrying the right maps. Mm, Yeah, that makes sense. So you say you're relying on your phone a lot for navigation. What were your navigation skills like before you did the Scottish National Trail? Because a lot of it's not signposted. Yeah, so basically, I feel like this podcast should be titled like how not to hike the Scottish National (laughs) Trail. That's how we learn. Um, (laughs) But I learned to navigate more or less on the day that I started the hike. So yeah, I basically, because I was living in Edinburgh City Centre, there weren't a lot of places I could go to practice using Map and a Compass. I did watch lots of YouTube videos and I got the basics of what to do. But when I actually put it into practice, it was the first day of the trail. And I just remember sitting outside the border hotel and just testing it to see if I was walking in the right direction. And yeah, I practiced a couple of times and I got the hang of it. And then that's basically, I just headed on from there and I didn't get lost, so. (laughs) That's good. That was my next question. Did you ever get lost at any point on the trail? This is like so surprising to me because I have the worst sense of direction (laughs) ever. And I rely on Google Maps to get anywhere in my car. But I actually only got lost on one occasion. And that was, I was still in the Scottish borders. So it started. It, close to the beginning of my hike, where I just completely missed a turn off. Mm. And I think I wandered maybe 100 meters away and then realized I was lost and then had to jump a fence and then sort of trudge through a sheep paddock to get back to my route. But that was the only time that I actually got lost. So I think the reason being is because for me, I think it was my survival instinct was just like, you can't mess this up. Like Mm. you have to pay attention. You have to look around you. You have to look at your map and identify where you are. And so I feel like I just obviously have a very strong survival instinct and I was able to do it without getting lost. Yeah, that's actually really, really impressive. So did you download GPX files to your phone or how were you using your phone to navigate? So I was using an app called ViewRanger and I still use it to this day. It's an absolutely fantastic app. So what I actually did was I, at that time, I didn't realize you could download the GPX files to ViewRanger because it kept making me want to purchase each individual day and it was going to cost me a zillion dollars. So I just wow. didn't bother. So what I was actually doing was I was flicking between like the route. So basically, I think it's on the Walk Highlands website, you can look at the route on your phone. Mm-hmm. And I was flicking between that and my maps to see where I was on my map. And then I was comparing it to the route on the Walk Highlands website. And it wasn't until halfway through my hike, I realized I could actually download the GPX files for free. Mm. And that was really good because I could just hit a button. It would tell me exactly where I was in relation to the route. Mm. So for the first half, I kind of just winged it. But the good thing about that is that it taught me not to be complacent. It taught me how to read maps and what to Mm. do and to pay attention to my surroundings. And so by the second half, when I was using the GPX files in the app, I had all that background knowledge that if I did get lost or I did mess up, I could get myself out of a sticky situation. Mm. And I think that's a really important lesson to pay attention to your surroundings, because I think when you're doing a long distance hike, it's so easy to just kind of get lost in your head or not pay attention. Mm. And it's like, A, that's dangerous sometimes, and B, you're missing out on the trail. Like you're missing out on all the details of the experience. Exactly, exactly. And I feel like hiking today has become so easy because of technology, but I feel like everyone should be able to learn how to read maps and use a compass and do it the old way because Mm -hmm. if something does go wrong, you do need that knowledge. Like your phone could die at any point and you would need to then use a map and a compass. And it does help you to connect with your surroundings on such a deeper level too, which is what I really love because I feel like 
in a way now when I kind of go out hiking I feel like I'm cheating a bit just by using my app with the (laughs) GPX files downloaded already yeah I know what you mean I've done a fair amount of navigation and map reading training and like courses and workshops and things just because I'm a bit paranoid and I like to know all the things I need to know in advance yeah but one of the things that I've learned is your map and compass should be your primary navigation and any technology should be your backup because as you say your phone might stop working. Exactly. And you can lose connection. Yeah, 100%. I think it's definitely a good idea to learn how to do it properly and then use technology Mm. as a backup, if anything. Yeah, I I just think we've become so reliant on our phones for everything in life, just about. I think for a lot of people who are new to this, the default is going to be, oh, well, I'll just use my phone. Mm, yeah, in lots of ways, it does make things easier and it makes, which makes things safer. Mm. But on the flip side of that, if you did get into trouble, you do need to figure out how to get yourself out of that situation. So yeah. I think bal- balance is key, but mm. obviously, like, learn how to read a map and use a compass. And you don't want to be on your phone too much when you're out in the highlands anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's the whole point. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You'll be missing out on all the scenery and all of the benefits of being in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and one of the best things about being in the middle of nowhere is that you're disconnected from your devices. And mm. so... <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. So was the actual experience of the Scottish National Trail what you expected or was it different? Oh, gosh, it was what I expected. And at the same time, it wasn't because... Mm. Like I was saying before, like I just had this like this instinctual gut feeling that you need to do this hike. Like this is very important. Something's going to happen because of this that's going to shape the rest of your life. And so I knew that by doing that hike, it was only going to bring good things to me. But then at the same time, I could not have possibly imagined how things turned out because I just had so many magical moments and I met so many incredible people and had so many amazing experiences that even now it's still quite hard to believe. (laughs) Wow. So what were some of your magical moments? Because I think for people who haven't done a long distance trail, it's hard to imagine. Like you're just walking, like what's the magic? Honestly, there were so many, but I think because obviously when you're walking by yourself and you're putting your body under such tremendous stress of a long distance hike, that you kind of turn inward and you become so connected with yourself Mm. And you learn to listen to your soul and your intuitive voice and you start to block out the ego. Mm. And I feel like that is such a magical experience in itself is that I just became so connected with myself and everything around me. And I'm a strong believer of the law of attraction and that if you aligned and connected with yourself, that you are going to bring more of that to you. So if you're like, you know, you're putting Mm. out good, you're going to get good in return. But I had so many magical moments where I would just be thinking, oh, you know, I really need this item in my pack or I'm feeling a bit lonely right now. I wish I had someone to talk to. And I would meet someone who had the exact item that I needed and they would give it to me. Mm. And I would meet someone and just have this incredible conversation that I never would have had otherwise that just completely changed my life. So I feel like the connections that I made on that trail were just absolutely magical. Mm, Trail magic. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) So you say you met a lot of really interesting people on the trail. Was that people walking the trail or people in the villages and towns that you were passing through? Um, It was a mixture of both, but I would have to say some of my favorite meetings were just chance meetings with locals and Um, I don't know what it was. I think it was because I was just so, I guess, like connected with myself and grounded that I was able to have these incredible conversations with people. So, for example, um, there was one woman that I met, um, it was near the end of my hike, actually, and she offered me a bed for the night, which was just incredible (laughs) it's the most amazing (laughs) thing when you're doing a long distance hike is you get to sleep in a bed and have a shower it's just the best (laughs) feeling ever um but she told me her story about how she lost her son and her husband in the space of six months Mm. and her story impacted me so deeply because it was just like how do you get through so much loss in such a short amount of time and like 
her words were so simple. It was, you know, you just do. You find mm. meaning in life and you, you just you get on, you get through. And that really, like, that has stuck with me for, like, years. And it'll, it'll stick with me for the rest of my life. Mm. And I, I feel like I just learned so many important things from people um, that have gone through hardships. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, somehow it's like the people you meet on a trail – the conversations are so much more, I don't know, deeper, or meaningful, or maybe because we're so connected to ourselves and we're so focused, it, we take the meaning from conversations that maybe we wouldn't in day-to-day life. Yeah, I, I honestly feel like you're just so much more open mm. because it's almost like, you know, when you're out in nature, you know, there isn't really room for the ego. There's mm. There's no influences from society and, you know, you can just be completely yourself when you're in nature. And I feel like, um, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I feel like when you are just your authentic self, it just opens up opportunities to have real conversations. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And, it's and incredible. Connect, and you connect with people on such a different level. Yeah, exactly. And especially other hikers too. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, yeah, you know, especially when you're—I mean, you're alone by yourself in the middle of the Highlands. You have a lot of time to think about stuff, <laughs> <laughs> and you just have these amazing conversations with yourself. And then you're like, "Oh my god, I've got to share this with someone else." And then, you know, some poor, <laughs> some poor person that you run into just gets an absolute earful of <laughs> of your philosophy <laughs> <laughs> of all these amazing things that you've you've learned. So yeah, it could be a bit of that too. <laughs> So was anything easier than you expected about walking the Scottish National Trail? Um, yeah, finishing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, at the end of every single day, I would look back and I would think, well, that was actually a lot easier than I thought it would be. Wow. Because every morning I'd wake up and I'd have this fear of, oh, my God, what what was ahead of you today, you know? Are you are you going to die today? Are you going to injure yourself today? Are you, is someone going to hurt you? Like you, mm. you know, you just you have all these like fears that you build up in your mind, and then I would just go and do it. And I was like, at the end of the day, I was just like, why was I so worried? Mm. Why was I scared? It was actually so much easier than what I thought it would be. Mm. And was there any point when you thought, oh my god, I don't know if I can finish this? Um. Yeah, and in a way, I think that was more like my fear talking, Mm. but I just had this like inner inner knowing that I would finish it. So I had to really trust that. Mm. Um, But I think the biggest thing for me, like the only way that I wasn't going to finish was if I got injured and I couldn't complete it. So Mm. if I had, I don't know, um, fallen over and, and sprained my ankle or something like that obviously I wouldn't be able to finish right so that was the only thing I had to learn to really listen to my body and take care of it along the way because um if I started to get competitive with myself and push myself too hard which would result in an injury it would mean that would be the rest of the hike over for me Mm, yeah that makes sense so what was the most challenging aspect of walking the Scottish National Trail oh it was (laughs) Definitely, um, when I got into the Northwest Highlands, when the terrain was a lot harsher, mm. and um, I when I actually did it, there was a heat wave, so, which is just kind of unknown in Scotland. But <laughs> I was hiking through upwards of thirty degree temperatures. Oh days on end and um my pack wasn't light either like I didn't have the super expensive lightweight Mm. gear so um so yeah that was that was pretty hard and also midges (laughs) the midges were pretty bad oh I I've been watching videos of uh, the Cape Wrath Trail because that's on my list of things to do and there's some days where this guy is just surrounded by a cloud of midges and it's like ah. How do how do you even deal with that? It's it honestly it takes a lot of mental power and you know if you can walk if you can walk through that you, you can do anything. <laughs> it's, it's so good for your willpower. Wow. 
So midges are these small, very small biting insects. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're just like wee bitey vampires. They're just <laughs> they're awful. But there were actually. Um, oh, oh, sorry to to shatter your dreams, but there's actually um, another type of bug that's even worse, which um, people don't really talk about. But there um, is something called clegs in oh. Scotland, oh. and they are like they're basically horse flies that bite, mm, and yeah. they can bite you through your clothing. Oh, yeah. Um, they draw blood and they are attracted to sweat as well. So they are just a hiker's nightmare. <laughs> okay. So this guy, this vi- these videos that I've been watching, this guy occasionally talks about shit flies. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't know if those are the same thing, but um, but I have seen him talk about other types of flies and things. So I think I know what kind of biting flies you're talking about because we had those when I lived in Mexico and they were painful and they drew blood oh god yeah yeah Yeah, so when I when I did um the hike so basically clegs in Scotland they I think they come out for a couple of weeks each summer and so when I was doing my hike unfortunately they decided to hatch when I was in the northwest highlands and Unfortunately, because of the um, heat wave that we were having, that made them just hatch like crazy. And so they had one of the worst Clegg seasons, I think, Mm. in like 20 years. And so these flies were, I'm not even kidding, they were following me. They actually chase you. And I was surrounded by hundreds of these flies sometimes. Um, It was just the most... I've never had to summon so much mental strength in my life than when I was dealing with these these clegs. <laughs> they sound terrible. <laughs> but I, I don't want to put you off or anything. I mean, it, it, it's only a couple of weeks every summer. So if you can kind of maneuver around that, you'll be fine. And of course, you never know exactly when they're going to hatch because every year is a bit different. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So I think it was in June they started hatching for me, but obviously, like, the weather was so hot then. I think, you know, maybe they generally tend to hatch in, like, July, August. Okay, that's good to know. They came early just for me. (laughs) (laughs) Just to give you strength. Oh, yeah, yeah. But you know what? They taught me such a good lesson, so. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you get out of walking the Scottish National Trail? What did you learn about yourself? Oh, absolutely everything. (laughs) Um, I just, I learned so much and it's stuff that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. And Mm. I I feel like it was just like, it was like a seven week intensive like psychology course into myself. (laughs) Um, But I think like some of the, I'll give you an example um, of a couple of like the most important things that I learned. So, um, I think one of the main things that I learned was to trust myself. Yeah. So that little voice in your head that's saying, don't do that or or do that or don't trust that person or, you know, actually do that thing that you that terrifies you but lights you up. Just go and do that even though all the odds are stacked against you. Mm. Um, I've really learned to listen and trust that voice now and I can honestly say that voice has never let me down. Um but I feel like it's so easy to block that voice out. And so I'm so happy that I was able to reconnect with that voice and it, it guides me through everyday life now. Hmm. Um, so that's, that's really valuable. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people overlook the mental and emotional benefits of walking a long distance trail. It's like you think, oh, I'm going to have this amazing outdoors adventure and it's going to be really great for my physical fitness. But but it's also great for your mental and emotional fitness as well. And I think, I think people overlook that. Oh, it's just, yeah. Like there is no way that I could have connected with myself. Like to, I, there's no way I could have learned those, those things that I learned if in any other way. So mm. it's just, it's so beneficial for your state of mind. Um, you know, because I have suffered from anxiety and depression mm. in the past. And I feel like it gave me, so many it gives me so many tools to just deal with it Mm -hmm. um 
so yeah, I think especially today, people just need to get outside. They need to step away from technology, step away from the pressures of society and just be alone in nature because that's that enables you to have those really important conversations with yourself that you need to have um, so that you can just create the best life possible, really. Mm, absolutely. I love that. So what was it like returning from the trail? Because I, I, if I remember correctly from your blog posts, you had a rough time. And I know a lot of people talk about trail depression, but not everyone knows about that when they go into an experience like this. Yeah, so I had never heard of post-trail depression either. Um, I had this idea in my head that once I finish, that the elation of actually finishing was, you know, just going to like fix every single problem in my life mm. and I would be happy. Um, but what happens when you do a long distance trail like that, especially if you do it solo, you come back a completely different person, but you realize that the place that you left hasn't changed at all. Mm. And you do find it quite hard to fit in because you've just had all these life changing um, thoughts and, and ideas and you understand what's really important in life. And then you come back to you know a society that is sort of like so materialistic and, you know, consumerism is just rife and, there's all these kind of like pressures from society and from friends and from family about what you should do and how you live mm. your life. And that's really difficult to deal with when you've had such, um, such an incredible experience by yourself. And, and yeah. And <laughs> I think a lot of people, you know, and, and I, a lot of people don't get it either. Like you're going to drop everything to walk for seven weeks in Scotland. Like that's weird to a lot of people. Like to me, that's my dream, but to a lot of people that's mm. like, what? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've I've started to like I'm working on this a lot at the moment, but I I feel like um, thinking like taking other people's opinions of what's best for you on board, you know, that is a, a good thing to an extent. But at mm. the end of the day, you know what is good for you. You know yeah. what the best thing. You know what the best thing is for you. So I feel like yeah, some people do think it's a little bit crazy and, and a little bit stupid and you know, odd even, but I feel like I'd much rather live a life that was adventurous and fun and true to myself than what someone else would deem appropriate for me. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree. So you went from being like a day hiker to walking the length of Scotland on your own. That's a huge jump. Um, what would be your recommendations for someone who likes getting outdoors, likes hiking, but they want to take it to the next level in some way, but mm, they're kind of scared about it? What What would you recommend? Well, I think for me, when I hiked the Scottish National Trail, I wasn't really thinking about the distance that I had to hike. I took um, everything day by day and I would only really, th I'd wake up in the morning and I would only really think about what I had to do for that day and maybe look at the next couple of days in advance just to see what was up ahead. And um, I think that mentality really helped me when it came to achieving my goal of, of completing such a difficult hike. Um, and so I think you can apply that to just, you know, your, your everyday goals. So basically, if you're a bit nervous about um, going out and doing a challenging hike, why not just take it sort of step by step? Like you don't have to rush in and do the hardest thing out there straight away like I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just break it down into smaller chunks and then you'll find that as you, you know, slowly increase the difficulty, you'll get more confident, you'll gain more skills. Um, it's going to be safer for you. So yeah, I think just breaking it down um, and then also – also, it's a really good idea to do your research. So just watch YouTube videos, Google a whole bunch of stuff, um, because that's going to really help you when you're actually going out and doing something. If you are feeling a bit nervous, I think mm. that really helps me especially. So as you've said, you don't really need to go from zero to 100 with your hiking um, like you did. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are some different ways that people can stretch themselves to new levels in the outdoors? Well, I mean, there's there's so many different ways, and I think it's sort of up to the individual up to the individual to know. Um, well, you know, they know what they want to do and what they want to achieve. But I think um, wild camping is 
quite a eye-opening experience. Mm. Um, so I, th- I remember the first night that I wild camped on the hike and I was terrified. Um, you know, I <laughs> just had all mm. these like awful thoughts that something bad was going to happen to me and I was perfectly fine. Nothing happened to me. I had a really, apart from like a, a bit of a, um, you know, stressful sleep, I had mm. a really good experience. And then the more that I went on and wild camped, the more I got used to it. And I realized actually if something bad's going to happen, it's most likely going to be in a big city mm. than when you're out in the middle of nowhere um, away from everyone. So um, I think giving wild camping a go is a really – great way to just um I guess adapt to hiking and being in nature um and you don't have to do it alone you can do it with a group of friends and you can Mm. work your way up to that but I feel like for me that really increased my confidence um with hiking was actually setting up camp somewhere staying there for the night and having to go through that whole routine of um setting up my camp you know preparing my food sleeping you know Mm. (laughs) Um, by myself in the middle of nowhere so I think that's a a good challenge but it it could be I mean some people might not be into wild camping so it could just be something like joining if you're a bit nervous joining a group um, Mm. of hikers that are a little bit more advanced than you and just going out with them and learning from them and and then you know building that confidence so you can go out and do it by yourself yeah and I think taking courses like outdoors outdoors courses, while that's more expensive, can also be a good way because you've got someone that's kind of in charge of the experience and supposedly mm. knows what they're doing. Um, so that can be helpful too. Oh, 100%. Like, I think um, for me, I just t- sort of taught myself everything, but yeah. it would have been so much easier just to go on a course and learn it from a professional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because with wild camping, and I think that's a perfect example. I've still not gone wild camping alone. Um, But a couple of years ago, I realized that that was something I wanted to do, but I'd never really gone camping at all on my own. And I'd only gone camping with other people. And so, and it had been like 20 years since I'd gone camping. And so I didn't know what to do. So Mm -hmm. I just literally got online and Googled wild camping courses because I thought, well, maybe people teach this. (laughs) So So there was this guy who offered wild camping courses where you borrowed all of his gear so you could try it out and see if you liked it. Um, and that was really useful. And that gave me the confidence to later not, I still, as I said, haven't gone wild camping on my own, but to go camping on my own in like campgrounds. Um, so yeah. That's, that's such a great tip. I never would have thought, um, to do something like that. So people teach all kinds of things these days. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's amazing. (laughs) So for someone who's looking to stretch into, you know, upping their game and hiking. What do you, how do you know what's a good stretch for you? Like, how do you know if a trail is too much or if it's too technical? Like, how do you know if it's a good fit or not? I think personally, um, I mean, I, I feel like now I don't really have to prove anything to myself yeah. because, you know, I've, I did one of the hardest hikes in Great Britain. So now I feel like um, I listen to my body and I listen – now that I – know and trust that inner voice I listen to that a lot um and I feel like if you are just wanting to do something for your ego for Mm. example if you want to finish a hike in a specific amount of time Mm. um if you want to continue on you're almost at the top of a Monroe and um the weather starts turning but you're just there and you, you kind of have that thought well it's not really that safe to continue on but your ego is saying like no you're so close just go and do it mm-hmm. I think you just need to be very aware of um the ego basically but well you need to be really aware of your ego and I yeah. feel like if you are trying to do something to please your ego it's not right you need to listen to that you know that little voice inside your head that's saying this is not a good idea um yeah, so it's different for, for everyone, but that's 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 what I do. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think a lot of people probably get themselves in trouble because they don't have enough time to complete a trail, and so they start doing more and more miles than they probably are used to or probably their body is capable of doing, and, and that's when the injuries and stuff like that happens. Yeah, and I mean, there was one part of the Scottish National Trail where – Um, You know, I was so determined to walk every single step of the way, but Mm. I had um, really bad hip pain and there was this 
this was like basically the third day into my hike and I had really bad hip pain and I had to then um, climb this hill, which was quite steep. And I met this woman and she was just like, you are in no shape to walk up that hill. Let me drive you up there. Wow. And I was just like, you know what? I could walk up this hill, potentially injure myself, and which is going to prevent me from finishing. Or I can have this one little cheat and look after my body and continue going. So I feel like, you know, that, that decision doesn't bother me anymore. I'll, I'll go back one day and I'll hike that hill, you know, by myself. But yeah. <laughs> I feel like, you, you know, just not letting the ego get in the way of doing something stupid. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good lesson to learn because a lot of people can be purists about doing a trail and, and think, you know, mm. I've got to walk every single step. Otherwise, it doesn't count. And that's exactly. ego. Exactly, exactly. And it's like you've got to listen to the inner voice that's just saying, like, no, <laughs> you know, you don't have to do that. Do this instead. Yeah. So. And accepting help, which for me personally is a really difficult thing. Like, I don't know if I could have said yes to that because I'm just really bad at accepting help when it's offered for me. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah. So we had a, a mini conversation on Instagram last week about getting outdoors and making mistakes. And you say that you've learned so much from making mistakes in the outdoors. So what kinds of mistakes have you made outside in the outdoors? Oh, I've made so many. And to be honest, I'm actually really glad I made those mistakes because it taught me so mm -hmm. much. Um, I think my biggest mistake was not purchasing a map in advance um, for the Cape Wrath Trail section. Mm. Um, I think by that stage I was really in hiking mode and I potentially could have gotten myself out of um, the sticky situation when my phone almost died um, and I didn't have the physical map to rely on. So I, think, I feel like that was one of the biggest mistakes and obviously like I'm not, never going to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but there were so many little things as well. Like when I started my hike, I realized I'd never walked downhill in my hiking boots. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as I started walking downhill, which was on the first day, I got really bad blisters mm -hmm. and, um, I basically had to wrap my feet up and keep going and just walk through the pain. <laughs> oh God, that's so awful. When your feet hurt, when you're on a long distance trail, that's the worst. Cause that's your means of transportation. <laughs> Exactly. Like it, that is what gets you from A to Z. So um, yeah. And I think just checking your gear as well, because another thing I learned was that my rain jacket wasn't actually that waterproof. Mm. And uh, I was halfway through a six day, uh, basically it was going to take me three, I was halfway through a six day uh, wild hike when it started raining and uh, I got soaked through and I was three days from civilization. And that could, again, that could have turned into a dangerous situation mm. where I developed hypothermia or something like that. But luckily it was fairly warm. So <laughs> it was I survived. Unusually warm. <laughs> I know. I was very, very lucky that summer. <laughs> So what would you say to someone who's afraid or, or fearful of making mistakes alone in the outdoors? Because that can be scary. Yeah, um, I would say that the survival instinct is something that is very powerful. So try and prepare as best as you can. But sometimes things do go wrong that are out of your control. And, um, you know, when your survival instinct kicks in, it is a very powerful thing. And I mean, maybe I'm lucky. Maybe that's just something that um, you know I've I've got or I've, I've developed. But I feel like when things go wrong, you basically just have to look for solutions, like accept the problem, look for solutions, mm. um, and just try and keep yourself safe. Um, at the end of the day, if you have to carry some sort of alert device with you, that's one of the best backups that you can have. Um, yeah, so I, I would probably look into buying something like that if I was going to go and do another big hike somewhere really remote mm. as well. So that's really interesting because I've been looking into those kind of on and off, but I've never actually needed one. So I haven't bought one. Have you done the research? Is there one of those that you recommend? Cause I know there are a couple and there's like pros and cons to all of them. Yeah, well, I did a bit of research myself and I personally didn't end up 
buying one so I can't really recommend yeah. the product or anything um, but then again just talk to experienced people in the outdoors and see what they recommend hmm. yeah mm. so what are your thoughts about a women hiking solo on a trail like the Scottish National Trail or, or wild camping alone because I think a lot of women are really really scared of getting outdoors alone but obviously it can be done yeah, oh, definitely. It definitely can be done. And, and that's something that kind of upsets me that um, a lot of women I talk to will say, oh, you know, I would love to go out and do that, but, you know, I'm, I'm too scared or I don't have the ability or, you know, and they kind of come up with all these excuses. And it, it does make me quite sad. And I've personally had all those thoughts run through my head as well. Hmm. Um, but honestly, my experience, like 99% of people that I met – on the trail wanted to help me and they went out of their way to help me. So that was just so reassuring to me. And um, I feel like if something bad does happen to a, a young woman, whether it be in a city or, you know, out in the woods or anything like that, it's just a really unfortunate mm. ex- situation. And um, obviously like do try and plan and prepare and do things as safely as possible. But from my experiences, like I go hiking solo all the time and I've never had a bad experience. I've had thoughts and I've had worries mm. when I've met people on the trail, like could this person hurt me? You know, mm. I'm in a vulnerable position right now, but nothing bad's ever happened to me. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the fear is greater than the reality because if, if someone's going to attack a woman or if someone's looking to prey on women, they're not going to hike out to the middle of nowhere to do it. Um uh, exactly exactly it's they're gonna effort. be yeah they're gonna be like in in the city or i mean maybe in a, a smaller town or, or village like they're gonna be in like places where you know this this other pe- lots of other people around in facilities and things you're not going to be in the middle of the highlands <laughs> waiting on the off chance that a woman's gonna walk by on her own <laughs> Exactly. There's like, there's no one out there. They're not going to, they're not going to waste their time out there. And um, I never felt safer than when I was wild camping in the Highlands because there just aren't really people around. So, mm. yeah, mm. I think that's a good point. The further away you get from people, the safer you are. Um, yeah, yeah. So what is it like when you're out alone on a trail for seven weeks? Like what are the, inter- I know we've talked about this already a little bit earlier, but what are the internal transformations that happen because you're so isolated and it's just so connected with nature? Yeah, well, a lot of stuff runs through your head. Um, I think I had time to reflect on every single problem, mm. insecurity, fear um, over across the, my entire life. So it was really hard sometimes, I'm not going to lie. There were times when I felt really lonely. Uh, there were times when I had my anxiety played up and I just felt terrified and numb. Um, but I knew that if I just got up and I kept walking every single day, that by the time I got to my destination at night and set up my camp, I would feel euphoric. And so I just one thing I keep saying to myself was keep on walking, keep on walking, keep on walking. Mm. It doesn't matter how fast or how slow you're going. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep going because I, it was challenging. Um, I think mentally when you've got these voices in your head saying, why did you do this? You're not capable of this. Um, you know, something bad's going to happen. It's so challenging to walk through those thoughts and mm. get through each day but as I kept walking my confidence grew and I started to have this like amazing inner transformation and I'm so glad that I kept walking because there were times where I did want to give up there were times when I was crying on the side of a mountain literally screaming (laughs) into the hills being like why did I do this? And obviously like just dealing with past traumas and things. And it was really, really hard. But if you want to be comfortable in life, you have to embrace the uncomfortable and you have to go through the the messy stuff to get to the other side. Um, So I'm, I'm so grateful that I had that experience 
you know, with myself, even though it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Mm. And from a physical perspective, was there a tipping point with your fitness where you went from being like this new hiker to it being easier? Oh, yeah, definitely. So I think it was on day five, that's when I noticed that my body was getting hiking fit. So the first four days were just hell on my body. Mm. Uh, And then I remember when I reached Drimmin, uh, and I, no, sorry, I reached Milgai and I was hiking to Drimmin and it was, I think, the first day of the West Highland Way that I was hiking. I was lapping people. I was <laughs> running past people with this gigantic pack and people were just looking at me like, this girl is nuts. <laughs> um, so like my fit, your fitness does pick up pretty quickly. That's really good to hear because I've never done a trail that's longer than like 100 miles. So so I think that's one of my fears is can my body handle that? Like how will it will it improve or will it break down? <laughs> yeah, it's like the first few days, like just accept that the first few days are going to suck, mm. um, especially if you're carrying a pack. And then your the body is an incredible machine and it's so adaptable. And as long as you get through those – first few days the rest your body will handle it's your mind and it's Mm. the mental aspect of hiking which is going to be the battle Mm. yeah and did you start hiking longer days did you start shorter and start extending your days or how how did that happen uh so I actually my days were starting out quite long because I was so unfit (laughs) oh oh right yeah so I was I was trying to keep up you know with this pace which was actually um the first week, the hiking was easy, but they were some of them were quite long days. Mm. Um, but then again, when I got to the end and the terrain was a lot rougher and it slowed me down because um, I was dealing with like bog and mm. and um, you know there weren't any paths, and so that definitely did slow me down. But um, I don't think I really cared a whole lot about my pace because. I always think it's better to slow down than it is to speed up because you're going to enjoy the scenery more and you're going to have a better time. If you're trying to rush by everything and you're trying to hit a target, I feel like you you do miss a lot. (laughs) Mm. So did you have a target for finishing the Scottish National Trail or were you just like, I'm just going to see how long it takes? Um, Yes, I tried to to stick to, um, you know, the route that's on our Walk Highlands as best as I could. But I found that um, that wasn't always possible and I kind of just day by day decided where I was going to set up camp because sometimes the route would have you finish in a town or a city and I was like I don't mm-hmm. want a wild camp there mm-hmm. so I would need to either continue walking past that town or stop just before and then the last two weeks there was actually a storm just before I went into the highlands and so I actually had to rest in Fort William for a couple of days to while the storm passed but I had allocated myself an extra week. So I anticipated the hike was going to take me five and a half weeks, I think. Mm-hmm. And then it ended up taking me six and a half weeks. So I'm glad that I gave myself that extra week just to deal with things that popped up, like the storm and certain days I just didn't have as much energy as mm-hmm. other days. And so I couldn't hit my target. But yeah, I think allowing yourself a little bit of extra time is always a good idea. Yeah. And did you hike every single day or did you give yourself like one rest day every week or two? Yeah. So I think I hiked six days on two days off. Oh, good. Okay. No, sorry. Six days on one day off. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Oh, good. Good, yeah. good. Okay. And were you wild camping every single night or did you ever have like bothy night or a hostel night or a B&B night? Yeah, so I try to stay in either a hostel or a bed and breakfast at least one or two nights a week. I kind of tied up my rest day, I would always aim to be in accommodation so I could mm. actually have a shower, reorganize myself and actually have a good sleep in, in a bed, mm, <laughs> yeah. not on the ground. Um, so yeah, yeah. And as far as resupply, I know you said that you wish you had sent yourself care packages. But was it fairly easy to find decent foods when you needed them? Yeah, actually, that was one thing I didn't plan that well. I kind of looked a few days in advance and just said, okay, yep, I can refuel there. But especially on the Cape Wrath Trail, all of the smaller shops are quite well stocked because they do have hikers coming through. Mm. So they are quite aware to carry that type of food. However, sometimes you're hiking three to six days without going you know running into 
a shop or a supermarket. So you do need to carry like five or six days worth of food. And you do need to restock up at one of these sort of smaller stores. But yeah, it could be, it can definitely be done. That's what I did. But I think sending yourself care packages in advance with specific foods that you think you'll need or specific items is a really good idea. Mm, that's, yeah, it sounds like a good plan. And what about like people on the trail? Was it, were there any parts where it was busy or were you just really alone a lot of the time? So I feel like as I progressed throughout the hike, I saw less and less people. Yeah. So when I started in the Scottish borders, I was hiking a part of St. Cuthbert's Way and I was hiking it in the opposite direction. So I did meet a lot of hikers on that trail. And the first day of the West Highland Way as well, there were heaps of people on that trail. And then when I got to the Kate Rath Trail section, I did stay in a few bothies and I did usually meet people in bothies as well. But they were usually just staying there for a weekend or a couple of days just to hike the Munros in the area. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you have any final tips for someone who wants to up their game in their hiking? Yeah, so I guess this is summarizing a little bit. But for me, the scariest thing about the hike was the unknown and yeah. not knowing what to expect. However, when I went out and did it, I realized it wasn't actually as hard as I thought it would be. So just be aware that the thoughts in your head are quite often going to hold you back. But what you need to do is actually try and help yourself out in that area. So do some research about the route that you want to hike. Talk to people who have done it before. Put yourself on a course if you think that you need the skills, if you think you need to learn the skills to go and do that hike. So just basically prepare as much as you can and then don't look at it as a one big whole thing that you need to achieve. Just do it step by step, take it day by day. And if at any point that you feel like it is too much, there is no harm mm -hmm. in just saying, I've pushed myself a bit too hard. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to relearn some of the stuff. I'm going to improve my fitness, get better gear, whatever it is. You can always go back and do it another time. Yeah, absolutely. Better to do that than to injure yourself seriously. Exactly. The hills are always going to be there. So it's just the ego that's going to feel a little bit bruised. But <laughs> you know what? It's so much better to be safer rather than sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So Yvette, where can people find you online? So I have a travel blog called Wayfaring Kiwi, which is basically about adventure travel in Scotland. So you can find me there. I hang around on Facebook quite a lot as well. And I am on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Wayfaring Kiwi 11. So it's a little bit different. Yeah. And I also, I do have a podcast that I've just started with my partner and it's just basically all about our life in Scotland. And you can find that on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And the name of that is just Life in Scotland. Yay. I really enjoyed the first episode. The two of you have such great dynamics. So highly oh, recommend it. Oh, that makes me so happy. I was It's hard work doing this podcast stuff. I know. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know, but the two of you are great together. It was so cute. Oh. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Even oh, though I'm not looking so to much. date anyone in Scotland, like it was still really enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Right. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to get this out to my podcast. So where can people get in touch with you if they have any questions? Um, so you can yeah, either send me a message on Instagram, on Facebook, okay. or you can pop me, in, me an email over at um, ev at wayfringkiwi.com. Yeah, I love answering questions about the Scottish National Trail. I've had a few people message me already who plan to do the trail next year. And if you've got any questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer them. Great. And then you'll have a book coming out at some point oh yeah i completely forgot about that <laughs> <laughs> i can't wait for it so it's on the top of my mind <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm in the process of writing my first draft of my book about my hike on the scottish national trail and hopefully i'm hoping it's going to be out maybe this year maybe Ooh. next year i need to figure out a lot of stuff out but yeah if you're interested in learning about my experience hiking the scottish national trail and basically well, probably more how not to hike the Scottish National Trail, <laughs> you can actually sign up, I think in the, I don't know if you'll include it in the show notes or something, but I can give you a link. You can actually mm. sign up and receive a notification when my book will be published and available to purchase. So. Yeah, perfect. And in the meantime, you've got three kind of mini guides on your blog, which are really, really useful. Yeah, yes. A really in-depth guide on week one and week two of the Scottish National Trail. 
And I've also written just like a a general guide to the entire trail. So I've included a lot of information that I picked up as I did it because there isn't a lot of information and there's no official guide to the Scottish National Trail. Mm. So if you're thinking about doing it, hopefully my guides will help you out. Oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait for it. (laughs) All right. So thank you again for joining us and thank you for listening. Thank you so much for listening. Please drop me a line and let me know what you thought about this week's episode. You can email me at holly at hollywharton.com or find me online and get in touch there. I would love to hear from you. Remember to visit hollywharton.com forward slash 368 for the show notes on this episode. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed at hollywharton.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-R-T-O-N.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.